good morning and good afternoon to wherever you are in the world. We're joined by more than 20 countries from around the world. So our name Ghana, it's good morning <coughs> to uh, Mr. Richard Dombo, the CEO of the Ghana Rail Development Authority. Welcome, sir. Thank you. And also good morning to Mr. Ziad Hamoy, the National President for Ghana Borderless Alliance. Ziad, welcome to you as well. Thank you very much. Good morning to all of you. And welcome to our second digital session of uh, Coffee with the CEO. Although I have been told that in Ghana we should rename it to Cocoa with the CEO, um, <laughs> because that, is, that may be the preferred wording for the drink. But welcome to everybody. My name is Daniel Bloch. I am the Portfolio Director for DMG Events, and we organize a host of events, B2B meetings, uh, webinars globally. We were scheduled to actually be in Ghana last week, uh, being hosted by GIPC and Ghana Rail Development Authority for the Transport Evolution Ghana Business and Briefing Tour, which unfortunately due to COVID was postponed. Uh, we will be in Accra next year with Mr. Dombo, with Ziad, uh, in uh, June next year. And we'll obviously keep you up to date as to uh, what will transpire in Ghana next year. Just a few house rules before I hand over to, to Ziad. Um, Please keep your cell phones off. I know we have to say that. We feel like we're in a conference room as well sometimes. If you would like to ask questions, and we do encourage you to answer as many questions as possible, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you've got the Q&A function and you've got the chat function. If I can ask you that you answer, ask all questions in the Q&A function, and we will obviously attempt between Ziad, Mr. Domba, and myself, will attempt to have as many of the questions answered as possible. At the end, of the entire proceedings. What we do is you'll see this is all being recorded. And within a week or so after this, we will send a link to each of you on the session uh, with the full recording, uh, including Mr. Dombo's presentation. And we will have all the questions that may be missed yep. during the session will be answered during the course of the session. So Same. without uh, further ado, Ziad, I will hand over to you to uh, explain how the rest of the, the morning will work. So good luck and enjoy everybody. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you, Daniel. The, the 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 video was stuckading a bit, so you'll excuse me. It, it... Yeah. Hello. Hello again. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh, Daniel might, either Daniel or myself might be having a bit of a technical difficulty with the connection, but thank you, Daniel, for handing over to me. It is a pleasure and a real privilege to uh, moderate this session uh, of the co coffee with the CEO. And we are privileged to have our guests, the chief executive of Ghana Railway Development Authority, uh, and another guest, which we will unveil at the time. Now, today's topic is the railway Ghana, And the rail is not something new. The rail industry is not something new in Ghana. It has been around since 1898, and it started in second grade. And then we had an Eastern Railway since 1923, which was initially built to haul minerals and cocoa. But despite the long history and the obvious benefits, rail network fell into the district of the country. And it was recently that the rail has undergone a revival in Ghana with ambitious plans to develop it and to drive the nation and to connect the region. Now, what is the status of the rail development in the country and how did the COVID-19 pandemic affect development of this industry and what is the way forward? These questions and more will be answered later on by our guests. And then we will have a, an interview, a questions and answers series uh, uh, after a presentation. So at the, at the moment, and while our guest uh, uh, sets up, uh, let me read the, a brief profile of the Chief Executive of Ghana Railway Development Authority. Mr. Richard Dombo is, Dedong is a barrister at law from the United Kingdom and a member of the Institute of Leadership and Management, the Institute of Customer Service and Alternative Dispute Resolution Practitioner in Ghana. 
Richard has been the Chief Executive Officer of the Ghana Railway Authority since April 2017, previously serving in various capacities in the railway industry in the United Kingdom since 1994, with qualifications in Cholo, Pickup, PTS. Since his assumption of office, Richard has led the redevelopment of the Ghana railway sector, including the structural reorganization of the Ghana Railway Development Authority, the commencement of the development of the standard gauge rail network in Ghana, the extension of the Western line of Ghana, and the supervision of the regulatory space, leading to an upgrade in standards of the country's train operator and the safety and safe operation of passenger rail service. In 2019, he was named among the top 10 CEOs in Ghana. He is happily married and blessed with three children, is an avid supporter of Arsenal Football Club of the United Kingdom, Barcelona FC in Spain, and Kotoko FC. So distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Chief Executive of GRDA, Mr. Richard Tombo. And I would like to invite Mr. Dombo to uh, give us his uh, uh, presentation before we, we set the ball rolling. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, and uh, my regards to all WebNet participants. Good morning and good afternoon, wherever you may be. I'm happy to be here to make a presentation and to take whatever questions you may have. Hopefully, it will be a beneficial time together. Right. <clears throat> okay, so I've been given the, the topic, the impact of COVID-19 on Ghana's real sector. Right. Well, Ghana has since the year 2017 embarked on a massive redevelopment of its real sector. Why 2017? 2017 heralds the era of the current administration headed by His Excellency the President, Danada Adedankwa Kufuadu. Um, won the December 2016 election, was uh, sworn in in January 2017. Hence, his government started in 2017. My appointment was in March 2017. Um, I had to uh, go back to the UK to serve time out and then come back in April to assume office. So I took office in April 2017. Um, and that's why we are looking at that year as a marker in terms of the, the change of pace in the, the regard for rail in Ghana. Now, over 300 kilometers of uh, development have been contracted out since 2017, with the main focus being the building of new lines. Now, this point is to uh, identify the fact that in what we call the uh, the railway master plan of Ghana, there are six phases. The very first phase is the rehabilitation of the existing railway lines. And that's why the second bullet point talks about main focus being building of new lines. That is to say, there is another side, which is the rehabilitation of existing railway lines. Um, tell me to impact it on Akosombo. Into the brackets, Akosombo. It's because the original contract signed in, December, uh, in November 2016 for the, what we call on the master plan as the Eastern expansion of the master plan. It was then called Tema to Akosombo, had to be renamed Tama to Impakadan because we identified that Akosombo um, until I think recently was the world's large, uh, largest man-made lake. Uh, and it is the source of Ghana's, uh, it's the main source of Ghana's hydroelectric power generation. And uh, it's over 65 years old. It's, an, it's a grand old lady. So, so you have um, the, uh, a, a, what do you call it, a freight train throttling past at 60, 70 kilometers per hour might, uh, you know, in, uh, what do you call it, degrade the integrity of the, of the dam. So engineers had to be called upon to look at it. And then, so we recited the, the route away from the main dam, Akosombo, to this other place called Impaka Dam. Uh, and uh, although the contract was signed in November 2016, it actually kicked off in 2017. And as we speak, it's a three-year contract. The, um, so it was signed in July. That is the effectiveness of the contract was from July 2017 to be delivered um, 
what do you call, uh, uh, sorry, July 2018 to be delivered in July 2021. However, the contractor was quite uh, optimistic and positive and reassuring that he could deliver by August of this year, 2020, well ahead of uh, his contractual delivery time. However, as the global pandemic took hold, that uh, uh, optimism has had to take a back seat and uh, we'll probably be looking optimistically instead uh, at the contractual delivery period, which is July of 2021. Right. Um, then we have the contract from Takradi to Huni Valley. It is finalized with the initial phase to Manso. <clears throat> now, this falls in what we call the, uh, the Western line of the railway master plan. Uh, Takoradi stands out. Tema on the on the eastern side is the port is, is a port city. Uh, it is mainly for the uh, uh, exports um, of uh, is our main export terminal, and then Takoradi is the main import terminal. Sorry, the other way around. Tema is the main uh, uh, import, and Takoradi is the main export terminal. Um, just a couple of months ago, well, last month, but June the 3rd, uh, under the supervision of the Ministry of Railways, I signed a contract with uh, uh, this uh, Israeli group called Amandi, who have a, a big route in here in Ghana, um, for what we call the um, sections, for the development of sections of the uh, Western Line. It was a deliberately chosen uh, heading as in sections. Why? Because the same contractor had uh, in 2017 completed one section of it called the second D to Takradi via Kojokrom line on the western side. Then in 2017, I signed a five kilometer contract with the same contractor from Kojokrom to a place called Ishin. And in, uh, again, in February 2018, I extended that contract another 17 kilometers with the same contractor uh, from, Kujo, from a shame to a place called Manso. And in June of 2020, it was just last month, again, we signed this time a mega contract, 600, sorry, $550 million, the equivalent of um, 500 million euros. Um, and we call it sections because this time around, the contractor goes back to his first contract, which is the second Takradi by Kujoku, which was a, a convertible gauge, but configured into a narrow gauge. Now we've asked them that because our trajectory going forward is to, um, uh, to construct mainly a uh, standard gauge. So go back and convert that convertible gauge, which is co currently in the narrow gauge configuration, convert it into a standard gauge and permanently so. And then from Takradi, which is a terminal station, now make it a through station through to the port of Takradi. That's, so in other words, there are no existing lines from Takradi station into the port of a standard gauge configuration. So that is another bit of the contract. So we'll call it, that's one section. The conversion is one section. Then again, he goes back to the end of the, uh, the 22 kilometers, five plus 17 is 22, which is at Manso. He goes to pick up from Manso to a place called Huni Valley. So it is bits and bits and bits, but it makes logical sense because then we now have a continuously running line from the port of Takradi, which is also under expansion at the moment, all the way through to Huni Valley. So end to end is about 102 kilometers. Right. And um, so that's yeah, identifying that bit there. Then the government, through the Ghana Railway Development Authority, also commissioned a review of the railway master plan. The current master plan. Railway Master Plan of Ghana was uh, outdoored in, um, in, uh, in, 20, in the year 2013. And as with uh, all plans, especially the railway sector, um, it's dynamic. So as and when new uh, dynamics come about, um, if the dynamisms gather together and become significant, then of course a, a review of the existing master plan is called upon. So for instance, there is a, um, a, a, a part of the country on the eastern line called uh, Kibi. When the master plan was outdoored, bauxite wasn't discovered in Kibi. And subsequently, bauxite has been discovered in Kibi. And uh, that, of course, calls for 
uh, a railway line needed to be put placed in Kibi to, to, to service that mine whenever it is exploited. And uh, we also have uh, areas called free zones. So for instance, um, between uh, Kojunukrum and uh, Enishim, there is a new free zone established since the, out, uh, the, the, the master plan was outdoored. We've got two or three other new free zones. Um, so you can see a whole lot of factors, including the fact that uh, this new administration looked at the, the demographics of the country and decided that uh, um, the country would be best served by redemarcating the regional blocks. So until last year, we had um, uh, Ghana had what we call 10 regions, 10 regions. Now, uh, with the setup of um, a, a dedicated minister to look at the redemarcation of, of the country, we now have six new or six additional regions. So we now have 16 regions. And it's part of the master plan that we should have every region served by the railway lines when they do get constructed. So the, the, this calls for, therefore for the new master plan to factor in servicing regional capitals of the six new regions that have been set up. So all in all, just give you background as to why we at the moment uh, 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 are almost com you know, completed with the, with the outdooring of a new master plan when it does come about. Uh, we're almost there. Um, among other things also is the fact that we are increasing the speed of the, the basic speed uh, for, for railway lines to about 106, on average, 160 kilometers per hour. You know, so that was not factored in the old master plan where it was 120, now uh, 160. So you can see there's a whole justification why, what you call, um, we're having a, a review of the master plan as it stands. Um, then we have, uh, as a last bullet point, the first case of COVID-19 was recorded in Ghana on the 12th of March, 2020. Now, uh, in this case recorded 12 March, 2020, suspension of travel into and out of Ghana was imposed since the 23rd of March. Since, that is because our borders are still closed, both to uh, overseas as well as neighboring countries closed. Then uh, the, His Excellency the President imposed a lockdown uh, on the 30th of March for about three weeks, 10th of March till about the 20th of April when it was lifted. And it was not a, a wholesale lockdown of the country, but uh, major parts of the country, i.e. The, the, the three largest as, uh, uh, cities or capitals in the country, Accra, Kumasi, and, uh, uh, and uh, where do you call it? Um, Tema, the harbor city. Then, um, uh, the lockdown, during the period of the lockdown, an exception was made uh, for certain essential uh, services or agencies, including the railway sector. Uh, the railways was ex excluded. In other words, um, if you went out with your ID card, the police or military you know, would not harass you. You could uh, uh, go about your business. However, uh, we're not insulated from the reality on the ground. So even though we're free to move about, the fact is, we have camps, we have uh, contractors and men and women working on site. And, uh, you know, they have members of society, infection here and there. So what happened was, let's move on. Suspected um, all public gatherings succeeding. Okay, this, my 16, this is just give you background about what happened in Ghana. One, suspension of all public gatherings succeeding 25 people. Closure of all universities, three. Monday through 14 days self quarantine for Ghanaian residents returning from countries with 200 plus confirmed cases of COVID 19. Um, but March 30th, partial lockdown. Uh, sorry, March 23rd, sorry, Ghana closed all its borders to travelers. March 30th, partial lockdown of major urban areas, Accra, Kumasi. Uh, April 19th, uh, partial lockdown lifted. <clears throat> there we go. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Now, this is what we normally get sent out uh, by the information ministry daily. Um, it's a snapshot, you know, uh, that informs people, uh, or maybe the, the country about where we are. New cases per day. So this is like a daily thing. So the top blue new cases would indicate like 270. 
confirmed cases, in other words, from when the first case was recorded in the country, we, we even though there are recoveries, we keep, we still uh, do not delete the number, we still keep it good, rising that from when the first uh, confirmed case was recorded up to now, we have confirmed cases of 24,518. However, we have uh, recoveries of 20,187 out of that uh, confirmed case of 24. So we now have, if we take that 20 out of the 24, we now have active cases of 4,192, which is not bad at all. Um, and then the total deaths as of uh, uh, the 13th of July of 139. So in essence, 24,518 with 139 deaths um, within the scheme of things would say, well, well, we're not faring badly at all. If you, if you uh, were to pay attention to the doomsayers, uh, what's his name, Bill Gates and his wife Melinda, who said Africa will be lit African streets will be littered with deaths, you know, this is uh, this was contrary to any such confirmed uh, doomsay or doomsday scenario. <clears throat> now, general measures taken against COVID-19. The Ghana Road Development Authority and its consultants, Team Engineering SP of Italy, and our main contractors, Afcon's Infrastructure of India and Amandi Construction of uh, Israel, have taken general measures in line with WHO standards and guidelines provided by the government of Ghana through the Ghana Health Service. The measures include, one, reducing the number of people in the work, work areas through shifts and rotations. In fact, my authority were quite uh, forward-looking when the first cases were recorded, even before the, uh, the president uh, talked about lockdown, we introduced the issue of rotation. Uh, amongst our permanent staff include uh, persons doing national service uh, who are only here with us for a year and they go back. So we felt they were non-essential staff. And so uh, in terms of uh, enforcing or implementing social distancing, we decided that national service personnel should go home and stay. And uh, amongst the permanent staff, those we considered non-essential for daily uh, 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 railway construction business, we rotated them. So we had a healthy work environment in terms of uh, I mean, particularly the, my, my, my authority in terms of, uh, uh, you know, safe and healthy, you know, way of handling the, the, new, the new pandemic, which it was at the time. Now, phys physical arrangement, rearrangement of the work areas to include social distancing. So those left in the offices, we ensure that those left permanently in the office were those who had offices of their own, such as myself and my two deputies and other principal managers and directors, they all have their offices. So there's no issue of congestion or uh, whatever. So they were not on rotation. And they are actually required for the essential, uh, what do you call it, uh, work of a railway development, so to speak. Work from home when possible. So when the president introduced the lockdown, like I said, the railway was accepted. So we, if we chose, could come to the office. Nonetheless, because you have to mixed with persons out there, um, we didn't enforce it. So we encourage those to, you know, persons to stay at home. Each person has a laptop anyway. So if it's an essential need to, need to, uh, to, to meet, not physically meet, you can use the phone, you use your laptop to do work, you talk to a contractor. I mean, so the, the need for physical uh, uh, meetings really did not arise, um, if at all, very rarely. Um, provision of hand sanitizers and masks for staff. We, we, uh, we, we have the conventional, uh, what do you call, uh, medical masks supplied. And we also had what is now in vogue, the, the, the cloth masks. Uh, mask. So we, uh, we made it a point to supply at least two of the cloth masks to each member of staff. Um, they, then if they needed more, then they get it, get it for themselves. At least we, we've done the two for them each. Um, then online meetings for larger groups, especially when meeting involves other organizations. This is after the lockdown, when we resumed normal work. Um, we introduced Zoom and Teams meetings um, um, to, to be with contractors and other persons who needed to inquire about uh, progress of work. 
Now, we look, we're going to look at it in terms of the lines. So in this instance, we're looking at the Western line. Incidentally, the Western line on the Ghana Railway Master Plan is our most sought after and our most uh, uh, lucrative line because there are so many uh, off-takers on that line. On that line, we have bauxite, manganese, uh, cocoa, timber, um, gold, and of course, the passenger uh, element too is quite active on that on that on that line. Now, um, so on the western line, that is where the Amandi contract is ongoing at the moment. So there is a re reduction in manpower to meet social distance protocols. This is what the, the contractor also implemented: the reduction in manpower to meet social distance protocols, lack of support from other logistic facilities due to lo lockdown. These are experiences. So for this presentation, of course, I spoke to or even before speaking to them during the time, these were some of the reports I was getting, you know, um, due, to, due to the lockdown, even if the railways was open, you still needed certain uh, shops open to, or certain uh, factories open to get certain items. But of course, they were not exempted from, uh, from the lockdown. So the contractor couldn't access these items. Closure of border, again, contractors and expatriate staff not able to enter Ghana. So I'm sure, you, each of you know of somebody or other who's been caught out by this, who, who had traveled abroad, because it, it was not like there was a forewarning that on this day borders were closed where people could rush back to their various places. No, you know, uh, in Ghana, our example was that the president was going to make a, a speech um, the following day, and the following day he made that speech, and then the, the lockdown was to take effect the very next day. So people were caught out, both locked in the country or locked out of the country. So this, uh, our contractor, Amandi, was no exception. They had expatriate staff who had gone off to Israel and South Africa and elsewhere, either on business or visiting family, and who couldn't come back in. Um, offshore supply of materials and equipment, uh, you know, closed or partially cooperating for the same reasons of borders. Low availability of materials during and after lockdown quarries. So we have quarries where of course, it's humans working there, and if it's a lockdown, you're not allowed to be out there. And if it's open, then with social distancing and other protocols in place, um, you know, no, no establishment is working at optimum, and for that matter, uh, it has an impact on, on, on deliveries or deliverables. Now, the effect of COVID-19 reduction in workforce, uh, this is looking at it, uh, month to month. In the month of March, when it all started, workforce on the Western line uh, uh, was about 25% when the site was closed for two weeks. Even though railways were exempted, um, the contractor deemed it, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, not, not feasible keeping it open because the workforce were not even coming in because they were afraid to, to go to site. So he just closed, he closed it down for two weeks. In April, uh, you know, a, a bit more confidence was coming back. So the workforce increased about 40%. In May, 50. And last month, workforce on site is 70%. Um, and then reduction in monthly average progress uh, is about 2 to 4%. For Koyokrum, a shame a section of the contract, and 1% for a shame to Manso as against 5% prior. All of this related to COVID. Um, the full effect and impact of the COVID-19 is currently, full impact, of course, currently unknown, it's still being quantified. Uh, a current estimate of the delay is about three months. In other words, the contractor says that the net effect of expatriate staff specialized in some certain areas who have been locked out and not in, uh, the work schedule, you know, had to, you know, stop due to supplies issues and whatnot. So if we were to do a quantification of, of it all, the net effect is that we are lagging behind by about three months. That's uh, the current estimate. Right, targets for the next quarter. Complete formation of, uh, that is uh, for, the, uh, for the Western Line, the Amandi con contract, that is Koyokrom through to Manso, the 22 kilometers. That's what we're talking about. Not the, the, Manso, not the, the recently signed one, which is the, uh, uh, the sections. That is, that is still not taken off. So um, we expect to have, uh, or to have complete formation 
uh, a final lay layer from Kojokrum to the viaduct. Now, there is a viaduct between Kojokrum and Asian. Um, we, 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 we like to, to consider that it is the longest viaduct. In railway terms, viaduct is actually a bridge. Um, uh, it's the longest viaduct in, in West Africa, you know, about 300 meters long. Um, and so the contractor is saying, despite um, the, the delays, he hopes to have final layer, uh, formation layer uh, by August of this year. The day ballast and sleepers from Kujukru to the viaduct by September of this year. That is laying ballast and sleepers. Uh, the completion of viaduct concrete works by the end of this month, July 2020. Completion of sub base layer from chain age 16 to chain age 21.1 by September of this year. Right, now we, that is, that concludes the Western line side of things as far as the contractor Amandi is concerned. Now we go to um, the Tema Impakadan line, which is uh, being constructed by the Indian group Afcons. And this is their report. <laughs> uh, 15th March, that is the timeline being 15th March 2020, six workers came from India and were quarantined for a period of 14 days. By the 25th of March, one out of the six was exhibiting symptoms of COVID. By 29th March, test samples of the worker and two other contract, uh, co uh, contacts of these were taken. By the 31st of March, Results indicated one positive and the other and the other two negative. The affected campsite was closed down and quarantined. Additional 30 persons test, tested positive through contact tracing. When this one person tested positive within the camp, we did a, a contact tracing of all uh, persons within it, and 30 additional persons tested positive. Um, and there should be another slide. In the end, there, were, there was a record of about 54 altogether, testing positive, you know, uh, um, within the, the camp. All the more reason why it was closed down. But as we speak as of now, July, all cases, or all those infected persons recovered. In fact, the camp was reopened uh, on the 20th of June last month. So all cases now recovered with no deaths out of the, those initially infected. Work resumed June 2020 with enhanced safety measures in place. So these pictures show uh, some of the work sites. You can see uh, some, you know, unofficial, I think, fumigate in the area. And this is an ambulance on site um, for any emergencies required. Um, consequently, consequently, there was a huge loss on work time, which impacted heavily on the program of works. Um, the graphs to the right show the reduction in quantities of concrete work and length of skeleton track laying as of April 2020 as compared to the previous four months. So looking at the total concrete, concrete works, um, as of December 2019, it is about 4,712 cubic meters stabilizing as of January 2020, not far off from the, uh, the December figure. And work actually accelerated in February 2020 to 5,542 cubic meters. Then March came along. Um, at the onset, it had reduced to 4,362. And as of April, significant, uh, uh, what do you call it, impact that reduced to uh, about 1,500 cubic meters. Then the, the, the track laying, as of November 2019, there was an average of about 6.75 uh, kilometers of track laid, rose 8.25 in December, uh, slowed down a bit, uh, 6.5 in January 20, nothing to do with COVID at the, at the time, had more to do with uh, uh, other issues. February, went down to 5.2 March, ironically 5.55, but then it dipped significantly to 0 0.65, hardly anything laid between March and April. 
Now, so that's, the, that's it for the uh, Eastern expansion, which is the Tema in Pakadan line. And uh, our mode of operation, uh, railway uh, development here in Ghana is that we, we have the employer, that is myself, the authority. We have a consultant to the authority. And then we have the contractor. So the consultant uh, interfaces between the, 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 the construction works and the, uh, the, the employer. And by the nature of the contract, particular contract signed with the consultant, they also undertake supervision, you know, and design phases of the con contract. So they are very, very interwoven in the contract. And so they report on the, on the, uh, on the states of the consultants uh, during COVID is also significant. Uh, so team engineering, also called IA, their policy regarding the fighting of COVID-19 was and is to strictly follow the guidelines provided by the Ghana Health Service in conjunction with the ones provided by the WHO. Since the onset of the epidemic, IA's policy was to inform their internal staff, clients, partners in a timely manner regarding any potential risk of contamination or health hazard. Aya enrolled in two extensive testing campaigns, that is uh, COVID testing. The first one took place on the 14th of April and was informed by the news that some Afghan staff tested positive to COVID-19. As, as I already ind indicated, the contractor liaises actively on a daily basis with the contractor. And for that matter, when Afghan tested positive, it was uh, uh, a no-brainer that um, um, the, the consultant had to do wholesale testing of their staff within the camp. Fortunately, none of their staff tested positive at that time. However, a second uh, test was taken on the 23rd of June, which was dictated by the fact that two of our senior staff tested positive to COVID-19. But this was not within the camp. This was in their, their uh, uh, laboratory head, I mean, uh, office. Um, more tests were done for contact tracing purposes, um, but uh, no, no, no other tests are positive. Now, for the project Tema in Pakadan, insofar as the, the, the presence of the consultant to supervise and other staff on the project, about 40% of uh, the consultant staff were constantly were, were available and constantly monitoring activities on the site during the lockdown. Smart working has been implemented for those functions, including administration, communication, management, that could have been carried out or carried on with, without an active presence on site. This is uh, the consultant site. The presence of staff returned to full capacity in June after lockdown of the camp site was lifted. For the Western line, um, as so far as the consultant is concerned, he said 50% of staff were on site, even when the contractor brought the operation to a bare minimum. Remember, I said the contractor closed on the Western Line for two weeks. Um, nonetheless, the consultant's personnel, 50% of workforce, was still on site uh, during that, that, that period. The remnant of staff was devoted to activities related to the development of the final design of the alignment. Yeah, because uh, their work particularly uh, goes on a pace irrespective of whether or not the cons contractor is working because they, like I said, uh, are also contracted to, to do the, the final design. So uh, they, they were carrying on, that's why they were on site. Targets for the next, qu next quarter with the consultant. Approximately 2% of the workforce have tested positive to COVID-19 so far. Even so, the overall operations of AYA continued with efficient adjustment to maintain operational standards. I wouldn't say 2%, it's a 2 of the workforce. <laughs> For the rest of the year, AYA does not anticipate any further major delay directly associated to the epidemic. A summary of current and future works. So now we're going to look at the, remember I said there are six lines uh, faces to the, the current master plan. So the Eastern expansion is, as I've already indicated, is the, uh, the Tema, Tema to uh, Impakadan. Uh, it was um, 
the contract, of course, has been awarded, awarded in 2016. It's about 65% complete as we talk. The remaining 900 kilometers of the Western expansion is in the final stage of tender. In other words, the Eastern expansion um, uh, forms or starts from Tema through to Mpakadan, through to the north and into Burkina Faso. So it is actually the beginning, the, the Tema and Pakadan line is actually the beginning of the Ghana Burkina Faso rail connectivity project, which is very much alive, uh, also slowed down by this uh, uh, pandemic. Um, the, for, that, for that next stretch, the 900 kilometer side, um, we've got two consultants who, are, who worked assiduously on, 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 on that project. Um, they were part of their mandate was to shortlist from the 11 bidding companies to, to undertake the construction. We have whittled it down to four as we speak, and the uh, progress is a bit halted uh, whilst both international borders are closed. Otherwise, we're looking at August, you know, when and COVID was not in sight, we're looking at August of this year uh, for completion of all contracts pertaining to the, uh, to the, to the, the 900 kilometer stretch. When I say 900, in other words, sticking off from Impakadan through uh, to Burkina Faso. Um, <clears throat> the Western Line, which we've talked about, uh, Takradi to Kojukrum completed. That is the second Takradi to Kojuk, uh, to uh, second Takradi, second to Takradi by Kojukrum that's completed, like I said, in 2017. And that was the one with the uh, convertible gauge, which per the new contract with Amandi is going to be uh, uh, reconverted permanently into a standard gauge. Kojokrum to Manso by Eshim, which is the, uh, the current Amandi one, uh, that is the five kilometers plus uh, 1722, is ongoing. Then Manso to Huni Valley awarded, which is the, the new contract Amandi have got, i.e. the sections one which takes off from the end of Mansu through to Huni Valley. Uh, feasibility studies are underway for the remaining of the portion. In other words, uh, the Western line uh, is about 344 kilometers from Takradi through to Kumase. With um, Amandi doing what they're doing, and at the moment we are currently talking to uh, uh, this uh, Afcons, to undertake another side on the Western line. So what we want to do, we want to, uh, to, to attack that line, sorry, so pardon the language, attack that line from the south, i.e. for the Amandi side, and then from the north, that is from Kumasi, so until they meet. Where we are with that one is this. We, um, uh, we have open discussions with, with Afcons. Um, they have been given Pre-feasibility studies undertaken by team engineering, our consultants, who incidentally, since 2012, have won the, the right for the entirety of the Western Line to do uh, design and final design consultancy services on the Western Line. And so any contractor will bring online on the Western Line, uh, they, 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 they have to deal with team because team have a separate contract for the consultancy and design of that line. And so, uh, team have presented to uh, Afcons, as it were, the uh, what do you call pre-feasibility studies that they've done on it. Afcons are, are studying it. Um, then they will probably do a walk on the line themselves. I spoke to the MD yesterday uh, 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 of uh, Afcons. We probably will start in earnest discussions toward the contract. Um, by Thursday of this week, Thursday or Friday of this week, they would have uh, been ready to, to settle down with us, having now known what it entails, what the, 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 the task entails. Now, what is happening on that side is this, that um, government has decided that from Kumasi to five kilometers down from Kumasi going, uh, going, going north, uh, going south, um, will be funded by GOG, Government of Ghana money, five kilometers of it. Then from kilo, uh, the fifth kilometer up to uh, um, the 17th kilometer from Kumasi, a place called Edwardin, that will be 
um, what do you call, uh, undertaken, that contract will be undertaken by uh, a Ghanaian um, construction company. The idea being that in the midst of all this revival of the real sector, uh, we want technology transfer, we want local participation, you know, we, we, we want that local content. So someone, some may argue that, but I mean, the real sector has been dead, so do you have any, any uh, uh, such credit uh, company in the country who, who can undertake it? Of course we do. Because come to think about it, most of these contractors don't do the works themselves anyway. They have subcontractors. I mean, you bring them in from South Africa, Israel, wherever you may need to, but it, it bears the name, of course, it bears the name uh, Amandi. And so it can bear a Ghanaian name or bring the relevant uh, expertise to bear. So that is the plan. So from uh, Kumasi through to Edwardin, altogether 17 kilometers will be undertaken by uh, a Ghanaian contractor. So Afcons then takes over from kilometer 17, Edwardin, down to a place called Obwase. So altogether about 65 kilometers. So when we open discussions of Afcons, it will be to negotiate on the 65 kilometers from Edwardin through to, uh, uh, what do you call it, Obwase. I'm giving this background to explain why the, this, uh, uh, what do you call on the Western line side, it says that feasibility studies are the way for remaining portion. The remaining portion is the fact that Amandi finishes at Huni Valley. If you look on the map, uh, let me see. You can see on the map, down from Takradi through Pristia, Dunkau, Awaso, can you see the Kesa? Yes, sir, we can see it. Right, so where the Kesa is, that is Huni Valley. Now, so there is that gap then from Huni Valley all the way through to uh, this map is not doing me favors. Obwase, there, this Obwase. So there's a gap between Obuasi and Huni Valley, not taken yet. So uh, that's what we mean by feasibility studies yet to undertake, uh, to be undertaken on that side. And uh, uh, and for webinar members, it is to tell you that it's open if you're interested. That is a very lucrative line, and it's open if uh, you're interested. Let, let's let's have your bidding coming. Now, I, I suppose that does it for that one. Now the eastern line. So when I talked about the Eastern expansion, now that I know that you can see the, the map, let's go back with the Kesa. This green line where the Kesa is, that's Eastern expansion. So that is the Tema through to Akosombo, Akos which is now in Pakadan. And then, it, then the, the 900 kilometers remaining that goes to Burkina Faso will be through the Volta region. In fact, that Eastern expansion covers three, in fact, four regions in, of the country. So have, Tema is Greater Accra. Akosu uh, in Pakadan is Eastern region. Ho is Volta region through Nkwanta. Bimbela, that is uh, Northern region. Yendi, Northern. Through Tamale, the capital of the Northern region. Through to Paga. Paga is Upper East region. And then into Burkina Faso. So it's a, um, and then the Eastern line is defined as from Tema through to Accra, which is the, the country's capital. That is the, 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 the purple line you see. And then moves on all the way through to Kumasi, the country's second biggest city. That is the totality of the Eastern line, i.e. Tema, Accra, through to, to Kumasi. So, there was also the OT region on the green line, right, sir? Yeah, you see, OT is one of those, I said Volta, you see, we're still getting used to this. <laughs> OT is one of the, uh, the, the new regions. Young. And so this map, this map, because the, uh, how do you call the new master plan is yet to be outdoor, it still bears only 10 regions. You understand? That's why, why OT is not showing here. But when the, when the so, master so plan is... While I have you, while, I'm so, sorry. so while I have you on the master plan area, there, there was a question actually about the master plan, whether it will be updated or whether it will be, the update will be released soon. If you can just quickly take that question off my, my list, because the questions <laughs> are coming in. Yes. That is not a problem. Um, the, the, the team, incidentally, team, team uh, who are my consultants, they uh, were contracted to, to, what do you call it, compile the, the, the existing master plan. So it made sense to, yes, to give them the review. Um, 
Yeah. Why it has delayed is number of reasons. Number one, you know, we started off with, okay, carry on to 120. Then we said, no, come on, move it to 120, uh, 160. As at that, as at, yeah, the speed of the, of the, of the lines. So, so they had to go back to the drawing table and then it came back, came back with it. So a few uh, challenges here and there um, coming from, uh, from the ministry and from the authority, different, different instructions. But now we are, we are, we're stabilized or we are now at a, uh, uh, in sync as regards what we want. They have, uh, they have uh, I think the next one for them to do is a stakeholder conference um, because we've written to all stakeholders or potential stakeholders. I mean, over, over 165 uh, or so stakeholders. Stakeholders in, include ministries, for instance, the Forestry uh, Commission, we would let's say the Minerals Commission, you know, and all of those, uh, uh, um, and let's say the, the the tourism sector and all of those ones. So they will hold a stakeholder conference to do to present what if they've, they've collated so far. Uh, so we, in fact, before COVID, they were looking at roughly October of this year. Um, I'm yet to get an update from them regarding uh, how COVID has impacted upon their delivery time. But uh, all things being equal, probably we should have the, the, it outdoor before before the, the close of this year. Will the stakeholders okay. forum also include development partners, potential development partners? Because we are also receiving lots of expressions of interest in partnering with the GRDA. We mm -hmm. just now in the presentation, there's a group from Sweden, a group from Germany, lots of mm -hmm. expressions of interest. And some of, would some of these bodies invited to your stakeholders forum, which is planned? It's, 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 an, it's not a closed, closed house uh, uh, forum, no. It will be open, but of course, at the moment, we have identified or identifiable stakeholders. Don't we? So I give it examples. The, main, the Forestry Commission, they will say, you know what, we would like the railway to pass here or not to pass here because this is a forest reserve. Uh, the Minerals Commission will say, we would like the railway to pass here because, oh, we've discovered a new mine here. Uh, the tourism sector would say, you know what, let's let, we would like this to pass here because we have this uh, major tourism uh, uh, asset over here. You know, so these are the kind of stakeholders I'm talking about. And of course, development partners, are welcome to attend the forum, of course. And then they can also look at a map and see in, in their own, you know, people do their own feasibility studies with or without our knowledge. So if they look at the map as it is, and then they, they presumptuously feel that maybe we in the, in, the, in the new master plan have not thought about something, they can, you know, of course, uh, they are at liberty to, to suggest it. Have you considered putting the line through here for this or that reason? You know, especially if they're development partners, potential development partners, and they, 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 they think that the line passing through an area of interest for them, for them they can suggest it. Nothing, nothing stops them at all. Okay. Um, so Eastern Line, I've given a definition, which is uh, from Tema Accra through to Kumasi. Now, uh, it is not, it's not a, a, a secret because it was out there in the public last year that um, from a, an initial 45 bidders, interested bidders, 45, with the, with the, uh, the, the consultant being PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, it whittled down to the last three. And out of the last three, the contract is awarded to one. The other two uh, failing bidders took exception to the award. And so, um, what do you call it, in all fairness, we didn't bulldoze our way and said, so be it, no. We listened to their objections. Uh, the minister took the matter to cabinet. The matter was referred to the senior minister. The senior minister set up an independent uh, committee. That is the kind of country you're in. You know, we listen to, we're a rule of law country. So set up a committee and um, uh, what do you call, after long, long deliberations, uh, I've, 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 I understand reliably that resolution has been reached um, where there may be some sharing. Is the, the extent of the sharing that I'm not yet uh, uh, educated upon, but of course I, I will be when that comes about. So they're still doing some fine tuning at the, uh, at the intervention level, who, uh, you know, the body that did the intervention. So the Eastern line ought, if there was no challenge, would have, as we speak now, I have been talking about percentage of work done so far but uh, uh, feasibility studies and everything completed, 
it's just a matter of um, the final, uh, as it were, sharing uh, quotas that are then be invited to open negotiations or contract, contract uh, negotiations with the two parties separately, you know, um, toward the commencement and takeoff of, 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 the, of the Eastern line. Now, whilst the Western line is uh, largely going to be freight, the Eastern line is largely going to be, or, well, it's going to be both a mixture of uh, freight and passenger. But the passenger element is very significant on the Eastern line. Uh, that, that is just to give a distinction. Uh, and again, like I said, the Kibi, that, that town I mentioned as one of the justifications for a review of the master plan is on the Eastern line as well. So it's going to be a mixture of, uh, 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 as it were, freight and passenger. Um, central spine. The central spine, let's show you on the map, is defined as from Kumasi. This is the center from Kumasi. This uh, is it. Is it purple line again? Yeah, right. I'm a bit colorblind. <laughs> yeah, so that's it from Kumasi all the way through to Tamale and beyond. That is the central spine. Now, um, you would have heard last year that the Ghana Redevelopment Authority. Uh, we were here last year that um, the Ghana Development Authority um, signed a contract with a Chinese group called Wuju for 500 kilometers on the Western Line. And in the same breath that the ministry signed a uh, 100 kilometer, uh, $500 million uh, contract with another Chinese group called CCECC for the Central Spine. Incidentally, both contracts are at a standstill uh, because of the because the the source of funding is from the same source, i.e., Chinese Development Bank, having uh, uh, agreed, you know, to all modalities for the contracts, having signed both contracts, CDB have kind of changed the goalposts as regards, <laughs> you know, what what the collateral is, and so we 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 I think it's you know we can safely say we are nowhere near uh, realizing that contract. And so, the, East, the central spine, uh, this is a public forum, yes, uh, we've not abrogated that contract, but I can just say any interested parties, as it were, can start sharpening their tools, because if we cannot be held to ransom for, for much longer, if nothing happens on, uh, with, that, um, with the Chinese money, then we'll be looking at other, other interested uh, parties. So as you wrap up, if, if, I can, if I can please uh, ask you for the sake of the time constraints, if we can yes. wrap up the presentation okay. to allow okay. chance for the questions and our uh, other guests also. Okay, so let's rush it. We're just on a summary actually. So ECOWAS line, um, feasibility studies being undertaken. Now the ECOWAS line uh, is defined as from Aflao to the east, which, which, is, which borders Togo, the country. Yeah, all the way through to Omampe in the west, which borders Ivory Coast. Um, the, the construction of this line will be in line with the uh, ECOWAS principles for a start, and uh, um, in terms of intra-African intra, uh, intra trade, which is the, of, of the ECOWAS uh, kind, as uh, economic, economic community of West African states, as ECOWAS. So that line, feasibility studies uh, are being undertaken at the moment. And then intra-city metros. So we're looking at the, this will be the decongesting, the capital cities, Accra and Kumasi particularly. So with Accra one, you would have heard about, uh, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, SkyTrain. SkyTrain being um, South African uh, uh, investors and, and, and construction uh, companies that uh, will be partnering Ghana in, in, uh, in setting up, as it were, a metro system in Accra. So the SkyTrain uh, project is still ongoing? SkyTrain, it's not ongoing, it's not uh, uh, because nothing is ongoing at the moment, but oh. it is uh, very, very much active. Active in the sense that um, it is only the COVID that is, that is stalling it. Um, once the borders open, the uh, partners will come back in and do a final, final feasibility study. That, that's what we, the stage we are in. A concession agreement has been signed with them, you know, um, in 2019, concession agreement. 2018, it was an MOU, advanced to concession agreement in 2019, and now, uh, they just only have to do the, um, the final feasibility studies 
and the and the, there's goodwill and there's enthusiasm on both sides. So we it should, it should see the light of day. Right. Ah, there we are. You see. Thank, thank yeah. you very much, Dr. Thank you. thank you for the enlightening presentation. Uh, I, you, you spoke about the master plan, about the effect of the COVID-19. We are very happy to know that you had no diseases. We wish speedy recovery for those who are still sick, if there are some. And we hope that the plans of the Ghana Railway Development Authority and indeed the nation does not get uh, uh, stalled or disrupted much beyond the few, next few months. Now, uh, uh, as we, we, we have the questions pouring in, and I want to start with the ones that will also bring in our, our, distinguished, uh, our distinguished other uh, guests for today. And uh, that, with this one, I'm going to start with a question on finance, because everyone, uh, everyone is interested and excited about the prospect of rail and interconnecting the, Africa, uh, the African continents we're using rail, especially with its role in economic development. And you know that uh, a couple of weeks ago, we have, uh, we have uh, commemorated Africa Integration Day. And we were talking about integrating the African market. And then rail has the opportunity to link up African markets and to, uh, and to drive economic developments across the continent. But then the main question is this, how to finance all of this? Where did, does the financing for the rail come from? And where are we looking for more of it? And what is the role of public-private partnership in all of this? Now, uh, I, I would like to ask this question to our guest, and, let me, uh, and I will introduce our guest, uh, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Ghana Investment Promotion Authority. Mr. Yofi Grant is currently the Chief Executive of Ghana Investment Promotion Center, appointed by His Excellency President Nana Adwa Dankwa Akufuadu in February 2017. Mr. Grant is also a renowned Ghanaian investment banker with over 30 years of extensive work experience in banking and finance, having served in various capacities in corporate finance and advisory, corporate banking and marketing. Mr. Grant has broad knowledge and great exposure of the African financial markets and has cultivated strong relationships with international private equity funds, portfolio and investment managers and brokerage funds. He was responsible for the development and the implementation of AAF SME Fund LLC, one of the largest agriculture SME funds in sub-Saharan Africa and helped achieve their first close of US dollar 30 million. Yofi was, in 2019, elected on the steering board of the World Association of Investment Promotion Associations, WIPA, to represent Sub-Saharan Africa. He is a council member of the Continental Business Network of the AU, which advises African governments on private sector finance and infrastructure. I could go on for, for hours and hours. In fact, Mr. Yofi Grant has a very uh, uh, long, severe uh, uh, career in the business. And I'm, it is our pleasure to host you today as our expert panelist, along with Mr. Dombo. And I would like to bring the question on financing all of this to you. So what, what, can you, can you give, share with us your thoughts on the matter? Thank you very much, Ziad. And um, thank you very much for all of you listening. And Richard, thank you very much for a great job letting us well, know what you. the program is. Indeed, um, I, I think that um, over the past three years, uh, Ghana has had the view um, that, um, and I'll start on an ideological basis before I actually talk about the business, that um, as in Africa, we should be able to use our own resources to develop our country. So he embarked on what they call, the head of state embarked on what we call the Africa, uh, Ghana Beyond Aid, which we hope has speculated into an Africa Beyond Aid. That means we need to do stuff ourselves. But we also recognize the death of capital on the African continent. And so um, for us, it's a, a combination of various models which will actualize this. And, and we do concede that there seems to be, have been quite an amount of Chinese capital invested in developing infrastructure. But the direction we've, we've sought to go is to get private sector to partner with government, um, as well as invite private equity funds um, to support some of these projects. And we do also recognize the difficulty of financing rail, because in many countries, rail has proven to be extremely difficult to crack in terms of financing. 
But where you have a private sector partner with government, partner with development partners, you have a model that seems to work. Uh, but for us, because it's a very important construct in the mix of the regional development, and, and Ghana has set itself out to be a hub for many um, economies in West Africa, real is very critical to us. And indeed, on some of our policies, such as the one district, one factory, planting of food and jobs that spread nationwide, real is definitely one of the means in which we would facilitate movement from Ghana into the sub-region. And so we do endorse and encourage private sector partnership with government. We are seeing that um, there is quite a lot of interest. Funding has been from multilateral funding agencies, private sector banking institutions, and national support uh, from countries from which a lot of the bidders are coming from. And so we have that whole pot of mix, which makes it um, uh, financially viable. And uh, most of them are on constitutional basis. And therefore, government is not um, going to, government will set, let's say, government will set the rules and the concessions are negotiated and agreed on. So that's the main financing uh, structures that we have for these. Thank you very much, Mr. Grant. I'll get back to you on the return of investment, which is an important aspect of financing. But let me go back to Mr. Dombo when you, you and especially on the regional rail strategy. We talked about positioning Ghana as a regional hub. But my question to Mr. Dombo, do we have a regional rail strategy? Are we aiming to position Ghana as a regional hub for West Africa? We know there's, we, you spoke earlier, Mr. Dombo, about the trans ECOWAS rail. And we know there's a Ghana Burkina initiative in that direction. But then beyond that, how are we positioning Ghana as a regional rail hub? Thank you. Um, two things. One, uh, ECOWAS as uh, an entity do have certain goals among which, um, in fact, the whole principle of ECOWAS is a closer integration of, uh, in the economic field of uh, countries of West Africa. And uh, that presupposes that all and every uh, uh, aspect of, you know, um, making that possible, which includes transport, communication, et cetera, will be done. And com transport, um, we all know, well, those of us in the South region know the, the state of our roads and whatnot. Now, it's it's a bit of a uh, of a, of a mis mystery why the era of rail, you know, took so long to dawn. The the importance of rail took so long to dawn, you know, on our, not just ECOWAS but uh, the African continent as a whole. Because I mean, you go to the developed countries, you know, and you see. You know, the place like the United Kingdom, cities like Hull and whatnot were built because of rail. Now you come to Africa and you see our roads are clogged, you know, uh, and uh, annually, the mini for instance, in Ghana, the Ministry of Ra the Roads and Highways would be allocating money to fix roads. And then no sooner are those roads fixed than uh, uh, overweighted vehicles, you know, go on those roads and spoil them. So in terms of uh, economics, I think the economists call it a food economy or something <laughs> because it's, uh, it never stays. Now, the railway in the UK, there's a saying that let the, let the, let the train take the strain. It, you know, it sums it up. Let the train take the strain of the road, so to speak. And so um, looking at the, uh, the ECOWAS setup and Ghana being as a hub, like uh, my, uh, my colleague Yofi indicated, yes, we are... Even before the advent of, uh, of uh, what do you call the interest in rail, Ghana, through our port of Tema, you know, was the source in the supply, uh, you know, uh, import supply for, for the Sahelian countries, starting with uh, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger, because these are landlocked countries. And so Ghana you know, was the gateway to, uh, to what do you call it, reaching those, 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 those parts of, 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 the, of, the, of the continent. So with the expansion of the Tema, Tema port. In fact, all of these things makes the, the, the expansion of Tema port a viable undertaking because um, the volumes will no doubt, you know, rocket because the train will be, will be doing all the heavy lifting. What 25 articulators can do, one train can do. So even the carbon footprint alone is, 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 is one positive, you know, of, uh, of the rural sector that, you know, and then, 
there are so many incidentals, including the, the, the incidences of uh, accidents on the road, you know, uh, traffic as a result of slow moving articulators clogging narrow roads. All of oh, these things could be a thing of the past. And so, yeah, so Ghana really and truly um, uh, as a hub, you know, through the Teba port and with the, with the expansion of our railway lines, will, uh, will, will, will actualize that issue of being a hub, you know, especially to the Sahelian countries. Yes, and maybe just to add to what Richard just said, um, we've just expanded the Tema port to 3.7 million TEUs, making it the largest port in Africa. And, and so for us, we are well positioned. As you know, I keep saying that Ghana is in the center of the world. This is the only country that's on latitude zero and longitude zero. So it's naturally a logistics hub. Um, you know, the maximum you fly to any place, in, whether it's to the US, you can get a direct eight hour flight to the US, um, six hours to Europe, six hours down to Southern Africa, and, and so forth. And so we are naturally positioned to be a logistics hub. And so the strategy is to really centralize Ghana um, for the, first of all, the intra-West African trade, but also to facilitate um, a nexus between the Sahelian regions, as Richard said, in the north, and the, you know, the, the southern um, nations from West Africa going down, down south. And Ghana is, is well positioned to facilitate that. But we are not just doing rail because what we have is a master plan that integrates rail, road, uh, water, and air. And as you know, we recently got a new airport. We are looking at another new airport, which will purely be um, a trade and logistics hub uh, for the sub-region. So that also complements what Richard just says. Yeah, you've actually taken the, some of the wind from my sail because my next question <laughs> has to do with the multimodalism and the need to look at the other modes of transportation and the connectivity with the rail network. We know that in other countries within the sub-region, there is a competitive alternative to road transportation that runs into the landlord countries. And we know that the port, the, the port expansion for the first phase includes somehow a provision to link up with the, Ghana, uh, with, the, with the national rail. But now how does the rail network intend to connect with the other mode of transportation? Let's say the Volta Lake. We have the potential for creating inland waterway transportation that would uh, that is proven to reduce the cost of yeah. the movement and the transportation of goods in and out. So we have such, a, such an example. We have Boankra Inland Port. I haven't seen it, uh, Mr. Dombo, on your master plan. Okay. Uh, we, have, we have plans for Kita Port. There's a Tamale Airport, and there are plans to have the Tamale uh, region uh, as an, a regional aviation hub. So there should be rail that connects to a regional aviation hub, or so I think. Then, of course, eastern region and western region dry ports, which we have heard earlier on. So there's, and there are also special economic zones. So all of these different initiatives are national, uh, 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 let's call them uh, uh, projects that can feed into the competitiveness of rail and also would drive the agenda of positioning Ghana as a gateway to the West African region. So uh, uh, I would like your thoughts on this one, and then I'll get back to Mr. Grant also with his own thoughts about how Thank GIP you. can also help. Thank you. Um, I'd like to put it this way, that uh, Ghana, as we, are, uh, we find ourselves at the moment, um, we're in a very unique position in the sense that the railway sector was totally non-existent when the, uh, uh, we kicked it off in 2017. And so in our forward march, we are looking at a holistic picture, you know, so we, we are in a better position now to uh, take a totality, you know, of the picture. As uh, you, Mr. Grant said, you know, that uh, when you go, it's not just about rail, which is what your question is about, it's about the, uh, the, the, the connectivity, the intermodality. So we are looking at, for instance, um, the Tema port expansion as an example. At the time of the signing of the contract for the Eastern line, Eastern expansion, sorry, that is the Tema to Akosombu, the Tema port expansion was not on the cards. And so it was just a standalone contract. But when, as of 2017, we were about taking off, the Tema port expansion was well on, on you know, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, on, on the cards. So it became, a change of strategy that we needed to have 
a, a railhead within the port of Tema. Within the port of Tema. So whereas previously it didn't go right into the port, the line did not go. Now we are, you know, lodging right in the neck of the port. That is the first point of the, the modality. So from ship to rail, rail down to uh, currently in Pakadan. You ask why in Pakadan? Well, in Pakadan is going to have a port, and that is where the, the lake is. So it will facilitate. So it will from ship to rail back to, uh, what do you call, to uh, boats, a barge or, you know, uh, at uh, Mpakadam, which will serve the, uh, uh, the, you know, the middle belt and whatnot, you know, where, where, where the waterways are. Ah. And beyond that, That's you talked about the uh, Sorry. I'm sorry. Just for clarification, doesn't Mpakadam have the ability to actually handle containers or transportation from roads to lake? Yeah. Well, it, 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 it is still under construction. It is still under construction. Yes, it is still under construction. We we will be interested in part, uh, 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 partners, partnerships from from elsewhere to you know expand expand the capacity of it. But otherwise, the contractor has a basic you know uh, uh, what do you call a uh, uh, port to, to 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 set up there. But again, it is it is uh, open to investors to want to come have a look at it and see how far they want to expand it. But that answers the question of the the modality. Then yeah. you talked about Buankra. It was on the map, maybe if we had a letter more, the map was still on the screen, I'll have shown it. Buankra is definitely a very much alive, you know. Um, and like you said, if there is an airport, you know, uh, that will be a new airport coming up. I, I, pres I presume that is Kumasi. Is it Yofi? Is it a um, Kumasi airport? Well, there's one that will be um, close to Accra around Pram Pram going from Pram, further, okay, from planes. Further, mm. yeah, further is on the Accra planes. Um, okay. As you know, we are um, actually putting up a new international airport up mm -hmm. north. Um, the, yes. There's one that has been done in, that is in Tamale um, to have international flights and Kumasi Airport also for international flights. Um, yes. So that, that's where the integration. But yes, as uh, Richard was saying, the plans to have Buipe and Buankra as landing ports um, for water transport are very much key in this whole um, agenda. Um, because as I said, um, and we have a Northern Development Authority whose main plan is to ensure that there's a connectivity between the Southern part and the Northern part of West Africa. And these are all part of the elements of it. It's totally integrative. And so you have water transport and then there would be, uh, maybe Richard didn't focus on the internodals, but there are quite a number of internodals that will also join from the Eastern line and the Central line coming from some of these places. Yes. Okay. So there will be like uh, uh, horizontal lines that link up the vertical ones that are ultimately serving into the landlocked countries. Yeah, and that is where the returns of investment, because we are looking at economies of scale and we're looking for volumes. And absolutely. the only way we can have the volumes coming through the, the, the ports of Ghana is when we show that we are providing a competitive alternative to the goods and the passengers who are passing through the country. And notice that we have mostly f focused our discussions around uh, a cargo, but there's also a huge and significant component of passenger transportation that needs to take care, especially of the main area, uh, urban areas, we, which are centered around the capital, around Kumasi and around Takoradi. So these will also provide some kind of economies of scale for any yes. kind of real development. And, and Ziad, may I add, may I add also that I think we have a greater opportunity to do this now with the signing of the African um, Continental Free Trade Area means that there is going to be an active or there's going to be more dynamism in, uh, in facilitating intra-Africa trade. Um, and, and therefore, it's important to have these elements of movement of goods and people to facilitate mm -hmm. that. And I, I believe that intra-Africa trade has a great future and has a great potential of facilitating wealth creation on the continent. And, and, and we, are, we are already seeing interest from Africans asking what they can do in Ghana um, for some of the other places. We are also seeing other investors coming to the country because of this opportunity. And if we don't offer them the logistics value chain, then that all falls flat. And so that actually blends very well into a, the value chain and the supply chain dynamics um, in the AFC FTA. 
So that brings me to the next point of the question, and that is on the return of the investments, because rail are very capital intensive. And you just gave us the mechanisms for the public-private partnerships and equity models that can help to mass up or mobilize the resources to build our network. But then comes also the idea of the sustainable development, which have to do with the maintenance of the current systems, and then uh, and then uh, both in terms of technical maintenance and in terms of human resource. So I think this question is actually going to Mr. Dombo because it has to do about how is the nation supporting the rail development by providing capacity for engineers, drivers, and other related economic operators? Well, um, like you correctly said, the rail sector is a heavily capital intensive uh, area. Now, and so for an economy like Ghana, um, that informs our, cho uh, our uh, you know, uh, avenues for, for investment, i.e. We, we have to look outside of the traditional funding box. We cannot rely on um, central government to, 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 to kickstart, you know, the, 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 real, the real sector because, you know, where, I hate to say it, but where on average, you know, a kilometer costs in excess of about $5 million to construct. Mm -hmm. I mean, so for a developing country, that, that takes quite a bit. We have on our current master plan, 4,004 kilometers, you know, to complete. So we're talking about an excess, uh, this was as of 2013, where it was looked at $21.2 billion to complete. Now, of course, times have changed and the values have increased. And, and so we have to look elsewhere. Otherwise, um, we'll, never, we'll never expand. And so um, we've got the PPP model. We've got the, uh, what do you call um, BOT, it's been a barter system, I, I dare say, you know, uh, and, and whatnot. So I think UOV, uh, that's more like his area in terms of the, the financing aspect. But for me, looking at it purely from the railway uh, aspect, that's why my answers mainly were in relation to where my developments go. But he has a broader picture in terms of his in the investment as a, as a whole, whole lot. So for us, the example, I gave you with, with, with the Chinese Development Bank. That's a typical, you know, source of our funding. Central government, I've told you already, uh, are funding the, the first kilometers from Kumasi to Kasi. That is the limit of central government's funding. The remainder, the, con uh, the contractor has to source the funding elsewhere. This uh, Tema in Pakadan, Exim Bank of India is sponsoring it, you know. So we're looking at uh, EPC, you know, mostly, uh, 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 NF, you know, sort of co co contrast mostly. PPP, there's a whole law, you know, uh, in the country, go you know, governing that. I'm sure, uh, again, you if you can best explain that, you know, that, that law uh, in terms of how it limits or otherwise restricts uh, its utilization and whether it's a proper, uh, we, you know, uh, source of funding for us. But um, of course, the, the, the private sector, you know, has, uh, you know, a role. In our, in our overall development. Uh, maybe, uh, Zia, just to answer your question on, um, on uh, return on, on uh, investment. Um, and I just uh, sort of give you a hint on how I believe that the CFTA is going to open up our borders and melt away um, a lot of our borders in terms of trade. And um, looking at what it is right now, we believe that the African economy is um, probably in excess of three trillion and would pretty much double very fast. Intra-Africa trade is somewhere around um, 17 to 18%. But if you look at trade with the EU, 65%. Now, we need to get to those figures with intra-Africa trade and exceed them. So the potential is vast. It is really vast. And um, I, I think it will be a justification for some of these investments. Because without the movement ability and capacity, then there will be no uh, trade. Um, we can't rely only on our ports. We can't rely only on air because we need to move things not just across the borders and the, and, the, and the shores, but inland. And there are quite a number of African countries that are landlocked. And so this offers a very great opportunity uh, for investment. And I, I believe that is where you're going to see the returns. Additionally, Africa has more than 30% of the world's remaining resource, mineral resources. And these will be used on the continent. In addition to that, it has over 60% of the remaining arable land left in the world. There is going to be a shift to a lot of movement of these um, 
uh, products, these economies, um, come the next 10 years. I, I keep saying that um, 2020 is a year for Africa. That's the Africa's decade. And I believe that the policies that have been implemented on the continent itself would facilitate that and give you the returns. And if you do look, if you look at the, the past 10, the 10 fastest developing economies, six of them are from Africa. I expect that to even increase now. If I may add uh, to what you've been saying in terms of uh, uh, the return for investment on the real sector, um, Per the master plan that is uh, under review, this, this, this is the, the estimates we're getting, mm -hmm. that by 2022, we estimate to absorb about 9.6% of free transport in Ghana, that's the railway sector, which is about 190, 190 million tons, rising to about 2.4 billion tons by the year 2030, upon completion of the eastern, western, central spine, and the eastern expansion. This will account for about 36% of projected freight in Ghana. So I think the figures speak for themselves in terms of return for investment. Yes. I think it's only fair after asking both of you so many questions is for me to answer a question of both of you. Because <laughs> you're asking that you wonder why the rails have not been developed enough to drive the African development. And I think we have been badly advised by our external partners. And I think it's time that we provide African solutions to our African issues. Absolutely. I think that and uh, some of you might recall a few weeks ago, Afro champions are presenting the trillion dollar opportunity in Africa. And investors know about the trillion dollar opportunity in Africa, and that is why they keep uh, trooping to the various African countries to unlock these potentials. So how come the African countries themselves are not able to unlock these potentials? I think it's time for us to start thinking about that. So, and I want to give you the opportunity as we wrap up this. I mean, this can go on and on because it's a very interesting topic and uh, the answers are enlightening, I'm sure, to all of our participants also. But we have some time constraints. And I want to give each of you the opportunity within 30 seconds to sum, to sum up, if you want it, to provide your organization's uh, uh, contribution towards advancing the rail development in Ghana. I want to start with Mr. Dombo and then with Mr. Grant, please. Mr. Dombo, you have 30 seconds about how rail will de develop. Well, thank you. Um, I think I've given you an overview of the current master plan and uh, the developments on each of the six uh, uh, aspects of it. Um, I've told you which areas are still available for investment. Um, and so, yes, they remain open. Um, then again, in terms of development partners uh, uh, or potential development partners, and, and as, as regards the, the stakeholder conference that I said will be held, you are, you are invited to it. I'm sure it will be advertised uh, so that you can, uh, you know, depend on border, border openings and whatnot. Otherwise, it's probably going to be um, you know, the new normal, maybe it's going to be a Zoom or Teams or whatever, the you know, webinar sort of a, a stakeholder conference. But either way, it's going to be public no no notice to, to, to you all. Ghana is open for business. I'm sure you will, uh, that is his area. He will definitely sum it all up in that aspect. But yes, the railway sector is definitely up and running. Uh, I asked that question and you attended answering it, why it looks like a Eureka moment has hit in Africa as regards the, the essence of rail. And so we, we, we are taking strides and not turning back at all. And uh, we, we, we invite the international community to partner us in this forward march. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dombo, Chief Executive of Ghana Railway Development Authority. Uh, over to you, Mr. Grant, for, for your closing 30 seconds about GIPC's role. Thank you very much, Ziad. And I, I think you sort of um, took my closing statement in your last remark. <laughs> that, I mean, Africa, this is Africa's time. And this is the time for us to do things for ourselves. Even if Africa trade um, is, is less than 18%, if intra-Africa investment is less than 5%. But the opportunities here, Africa has always been touted as the richest bit, bit of God's real estate. Yet our people are poor. This is the opportunity that we cannot miss. This is our time and this is our, our decade. I, I some... And, and Ghana is a microcosmic example of Africa. And I, I, I sum the Ghana opportunity as the three O's. The first one being opportunity. We are minerals rich, we are resources rich, we are people rich, and we have the spirit and we are in the middle of the, of the world. The second O is we are open. 
we engage, we, we discuss with the investor, we create winning partnerships and linkages. And then the last one is optimism. I mean, till COVID struck, Ghana's economy was fast becoming one of the fastest growing economies in the world. In fact, the World Bank and the IMF projected Ghana's economy to be the fastest growing in the world. And that is just a bit of what Africa offers. It offers hope for the world. It offers hope for the world achieving the sustainable development goals. And we should take advantage of it. And so we say, as uh, Richard said, Ghana, we are open for business. We are looking for partnerships. We are looking for linkages that will tell a very beautiful African story in the next 10 years. So thank you very much for inviting me to speak. And if you want to hear more about Ghana, please check our website, the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, and uh, or contact me. I'm sure my details will be made available. And we shall take you through the various opportunities that are there. And let's make this a beautiful world together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yofi Grant, Chief Executive Officer of Ghana Investment Promotion Center. Indeed, Ghana is open for business, Rail is open for partnerships, and we want to move forward and so find sol African solutions to African problems. I think this has been a very fruitful dialogue. I thank both of our high-level panelists and for the presentation that was offered earlier. We had, unfortunately, so many questions. We, I think we have approached most of the, uh, of the questions, but in case there were some of the questions that we haven't solved, uh, we haven't answered yet, we will send you back later in order to provide us some kind of answer to some of them. There are some requests for information about your social uh, uh, networks and social links. We will send this later also to the members. And uh, I thank you for both for your attention. I thank all of our participants. Over to Daniel also for his closing remarks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, again, to, to each of our uh, panelists, thank you so much for your time. We know that you are extremely busy. Um, we, we have a fantastic partnership with all three organizations, um, firstly to Ghana Rail Development Authority and uh, Ghana Investment Promotion Center, who will be hosting us, or, or we're supposed to host us in Ghana this year, uh, last, last week actually, but we look forward to uh, being with you in June 2021 for our uh, business mission and briefing tour, and then to also to Ziad and Borderless Alliance. Uh, thank you, Ziad. Excellent moderating. Definitely keep your job. Um, and as well as the partnerships, yeah, it's been uh, instrumental in providing us with uh, a lot of information, facts about what is happening, not just in Ghana, but uh, around the African continent. We value your contributions. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, as, you have, as you have mentioned, all these presentations, uh, as well as uh, the recording of the Zoom session will be sent to each and every attendee uh, for today. Uh, what we'll also do is the questions that may not have been answered, uh, we will be sharing with both uh, um, yourself, Mr. Domba and Mr. Grant, uh, just for further clarification, if there's anything that you'd like to add, and then we make that available to all the attendees. So that will be fantastic. Um, once again, thank you so much. And uh, this series does continue, uh, where we focus on, uh, uh, in the next uh, couple of months, we focus on countries like Morocco, uh, we look at Namibia, Kenya, Tanzania. So. Uh, we, we, we try and explore the entire African continent and see where uh, the transport infrastructure can take us and what the opportunities are, uh, not just to get around COVID, but uh, business will continue, lives will continue as we move into 2021. So again, thank you to each and every one of you for your time and uh, enjoy the rest of your what's left of the afternoon. Thank you again. Okay. And thank please you. continue. <laughs> <laughs> right. Mr. Grant? Thank you. Bye-bye for now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye.